name is Matt, and I will be talking with Juan Garbery about understanding business needs and customizing leadership approach. Juan, and for the past seven years, you work here, or eight years already, right? You are in Germany eight years, right? Yes, let's say it's seven years almost, yeah. Seven years or something. So you work as an engineering manager, head of engineering, leading various teams here, mm -hmm. pretty international as far as I yep. know. <laughs> uh, um, and I'm just always wondering, like, how was your switch from the software developer? Because you are in the tech business for quite a while, yes. like a managerial role. So it was basically by accident. Um, and involved a lot of killing the evil, but that is a separate topic. Um, but basically, I, I was working, I, I joined a company, and then in this company, one of the, the strongest engineers that later became my mentor, poached me to go to a startup. And he told me, look, I need a senior backend engineer working with us. Um, I made the jump to senior after the interviews and everything. And this guy is really talented, but he was mainly a co-way programmer. And he built an amazing team, but he was not taking care of the team in a good way. I mean, because he was doing something else. Um, it's, it's a really big servant. Um, so basically, I tried to support him on these little things about the structuring, the deliveries. Uh, we didn't have like a formal process working with product. We were working with uh, one of the engineers and a mathematician, and we needed to structure the, the business rules on how everything should work. And then organically fell on that role while he was doing the other part, while I was doing coding. And eventually, one day, he decided to part ways with the companies and say, like, I want to do something else. Um, and this is great because Mariano is his name. He, went, talked to the owner of the startup, talked with who will be my boss, with everyone, and said, no, Juan is ready to take over the team. He's already doing it. And by the way, this is, these are his, I already talked to him. This is are his um, compensation expectations. And then he came tapping on the shoulder and said, like, sorry, dude, I'm leaving. I already gave my notice. In Argentina, it's between two weeks and a month. And you got this. And he packed the bag for Friday and then came back for a couple of more days. And then he went on vacation and bye. Uh, so yeah, I took over a team and that was a really nice experience. And then I applied for another company called Globant. Um, basically, they needed a tech lead and the role of the engineering manager as is, or engineering lead as is seen here in Europe was not fully defined there. So I realized, okay, this engineer maybe requires some guidance on the career development or maybe requires some tooling on how to develop themselves or how to distribute the workload. We're working with project managers, not with project owners. So I kind of fell under the role and kept maturing and maturing and evolving. So it was basically organically. I realized that I could contribute more by unblocking others than with my code alone. I love coding, but I realized I can only code for one person. But if I do my job right, I can grab a team of 10 people and really make a difference. So yeah, impact-wise, it, it was a no-brainer. Well, what you said, it makes a lot of sense, but I'm just wondering from your perspective, was something surprising for you? Like, mean like, because as a software developer, you see only the side of uh, developing the software. You don't see the high level so much or like the video yes. and so on. So I'm just wondering what was it for so you? So I have this idea that uh, you shall sit for 50 minutes with all the stakeholders. They say, okay, you do this, I do this, I do this, you do this. And then everybody goes their own way and everything is done. And I discovered the human factor behind the projects and that not everybody delivers the same. I, so I needed to understand what were the complexities of every person and how they want to deliver or what they can deliver or how they want to grow. I seen really talented engineers that cannot work with other people because the setting is not right. So like the main challenge was understanding that it was not a problem that I should need to factorize the project but also to understand that there were at least seven more layers behind and those layers were evolving constantly. So it's kind of like in a battlefield or let's say uh, you, like if you're playing a team sport and then you see like an, an opening and then you play there and then you fall back and then you move forward and then you fall back and then you see another clear and then you move forward. Um, so that was that, like it was like the same realization. As a developer, I always thought the mythical man moth, everybody knows this book. And, and how come like project manager, engineering leaders like doesn't know this? It's not that easy. Everybody understands this conceptually, but whenever you need to start working with the people, 
that's a complete, completely separate beast. Like it's a different animal, and how you handle the process is completely different. So that was the the big reality check. And how about the the vault? Because you're working at vault for quite a while, and I'm just wondering the the really specific thing because my experience with uh, with clients and people from Finland working, they are really close. They are super introverts. Like if I compare. I work with guys from Norway, from Denmark, from Iceland, from Sweden, but like to work with the guys from Finland, it's so difficult even like, you know, to get into this, uh, you know, they are different, com they are different skill sets. I, I, I don't like to think about the word competencies. It's different toolbox. Uh -huh. It's funny because they ask you where you're from and you tell me you're Polish. I work with, uh, my first contact with Polish engineers, for example, but it was the same reading that you are telling me about the, the Finnish culture. And after two weeks, it's just like, I'm from Buenos Aires. It's like, these are porteños that speak Polish. Culture, we have so much in common. So it's more about finding the elements that you have in common. Um, having a professional setting and having uh, a certain, let's call it behavioral, uh, like contract, it, it really helps. Um, Basically, it's about uh, being flexible and being understanding that people have different competencies. I can give you an example on this. For example, I'm, I'm a bit on the spectrum. I'm still getting diagnosed. And I was working with an engineer who was, uh, out of respect, shall remain nameless, great guy. Um, he was not diagnosed, but he was having struggles because our director was really pushing him to speak in conferences, but with a really good positive attitude. It's like, hey, dude, you can get you promoted, but it's really pre-pandemic to go to this conference and do this and do that. There was a cultural barrier as well from uh, his country of origin. And he felt like really challenges on that. And it's like, he doesn't need to do this. It's not like a checkbox. Why don't we put this person to work on a project that they feel comfortable? I don't have to be talking with people every 24 hours with a status update, I'm breaking down. It's like, you know what? You do this, cowboy programmer style, get back to us every two days with a written report. It's, this is this, this is it. Keep the tickets up to date, man. That's it. So um, I'm funny because of all the people that I work, especially for Northern countries, the Finnish were the most warm of all. That really open. Really? Uh, yes. Okay. But it, it was quite interesting. Or city was Finnish. Amazing guy, uh, one of our data analysts, data scientists, uh, or two of, of us, one data analyst, one uh, data scientist, uh, Tori and Jaco, Finnish, and it's I, five minutes in, okay, let's have a beer and talk. Mm -hmm. The project, code, life, and everything, and they have been really warm with me. But people tend to open up with me, and I think that is kind of like a, a really nice tool that I have um, being an engineer lead or a manager. I think it's a great skill, right? Especially in such a, a different environment with different nationalities. Being an introvert and having the skill, it, it was hard growing up. Uh, but then I realized that, uh, yeah, okay, people talk to me. Let's embrace this. So it's about uh, investing with the cultural differences, not in the limitations, but also investing a lot in the strong points. We are not the same and it's fantastic. So um, I wanted to discuss the last yeah. two years and like the this mm -hmm. year because like two years ago the 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 market was hyped like a big tech was hyped the, the hiring it was crazy it was really hard to find anybody to call to build a digital product then another year I mean 2023 we entered the recession which he did like really hard I mean so many layoffs and I'm just wondering and and, and trying to ask other leaders how do they see and how does the organizations uh, see the 2024? I'm, I mean, I've been at Wolf for close to a year. And before that, I worked for two other companies, Wolf Photo and another one called Haycar. Heavily funded the startups with a lot of growth, great companies, especially Photo. Uh, but for me, it didn't make sense the aggressiveness that they have been growing. And it's, I, I could understand there are investors and they need to see results so you get more hands-on to work on things. Hire smart people and move things forward. Yeah, it was quite a blow to see 
for my last company to see all the layoffs, I, they had to reduce the scale. Sadly, it, it happened out of their control. But I think sadly it was to be expected. For me, it didn't make sense the way many, I'm not talking about these two companies, but overall how aggressive they were hiring. Um, mm -hmm. The compensation wise and everything, I know I'm going to be like, <laughs> oh, dude, don't say that, but um, being a Latin American in, in, in Berlin and talking with other, with people who has, I don't know, a PhD and two masters and, and, and then comparing overall salaries and saying like, okay, I'm really happy, it took a lot of work to be here, but there is a lot of disparity. It, I, I kind of sense that maybe coming from Latin America and expecting the worst, it was kind of expecting for this to happen. Uh, it, it was no surprise because something growing up on everybody in my family started their own companies. And so I grew up on this startup um, mentality. Well, they didn't call it startup, they just called it companies. <laughs> and it was always about the revenue and it's about, about the point of, we call it the point of equilibrium or the tipping point when you say like, okay, I'm spending this much, I'm earning this much, mm -hmm. how long can I hold it? And my last company, I was, I was asking, it's like on this work model, like how do we make profit? And this is how I also try to run the teams. And ever since I became a lead, it's like how are we becoming profitable without going into intricacies of budget, but how are we delivering value? Yeah. I don't know if this answers the question. The, the way I see it is, it was bound to explode. It was, it's the same that happened with real estate. It's like loans, loans, loans. It's the companies, uh, sorry, the property devaluated eventually. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I fully agree with that. The market is a bit cleaned off, I would say, uh, and we are getting to like a healthy approach, right? To in our, hiring. In Argentina, it happened the same. When we have the economical crash, the second to last, I believe now, but in 2001, I remember like the whole economy was in recession. This was before the Greek recession, two years before. Yeah, 2001. And I remember like talking with relatives that had companies and everything. They said like, if you get a loan right now, it's impossible. Like it's, you got it from like some weird or high rate, it's not good. But the money that is on the street, there is money that is well back up. If someone sends you a check, it's that. Someone make a car payment, it's that. Because nobody gives credit. And I think that now the IT company, the companies uh, are, are the same. Like the ones who remain strong, like this one, who by the way didn't have any layoffs, mm -hmm. which is quite a lot. They didn't, kept growing, uh, says a lot, uh, are the ones who are like the really strong and they were like properly organized and also they were lucky because they aim for a model that was sustainable, but yeah. And how do you see this year? Are you optimistic or pessimistic or? I, I, I see a lot of fates coming up and now, now everybody's here now. Yesterday I was reading about this new technology that I forgot the name that supposedly is going to fully replace engineers. Um, even with all this, I think like the companies that are remaining are going to continue going strong. Uh, again, for the same reasons. If they survive this latest backlash, they can only grow. Uh, but well, let's see, because also different elections in different countries right now. Um, the conflict here, the war in Europe didn't help. Um, but yeah, I feel optimistic. If not, um, we are like, we software engineers, we will always find like a small project and something to, to move forward. Luckily, we are not as tight as other lines of profession that are more dependent on the whole ecosystem of the world, uh, of, of their, sorry, of their village, if you will, or the city. I can work from anywhere in the world. Like my current limitation is my kid's school right now. Yes. That's it. So yeah. So one way or another, I think, software developers are going to continue moving forward. Um, I wanted to tackle the pain points and challenges uh, after like so many years being like a leader for engineering teams. Yes. I'm wondering, do you, can you name like some, not some widely popular, nobody mentioning maybe uh, pain points that the, you, maybe you had or you saw? Yes, when, when we started it was, when I was 20 it was, and this persisted, it was the guys from IT. Uh, like these guys with weird t-shirts and they look like the delivery guy, but they are building a whole ecosystem in the cloud. And we were seeing like these weird people who are hard to talk to. And there is a now a tendency uh, that, but it's still moving really slow, 
where the companies are allowing engineers to have a better understanding of the products that they are building and we are preventing a waterfall uh, basically let's say business has an idea then they talk to the designer the designer builds an interface product manager or owners evolves this and then they get to the engineer and the engineer says, i don't know how to build this or it's going to take two years uh, now many companies are involving engineers from the beginning and they do like they have, we all sit on the same table this is what we do here and we try to understand what is the problem space? I mean, we can come up and say, no, look, yes, we can build this whole thing, but what you need right now is a monitoring for these three events. Here, like, give me an hour. There you got it. We just bought the project three months while we build this, and they, the people can continue operate. So, uh, but I still see of many companies that they tend to ostracize engineers uh, because they see it like the better of bad news. Um, I don't know, like, I have civil engineers friends that work really close with architects and they have amazing buildings because they know how much they can push the structure because they have the civil engineer right there. So what's the difference with, with software developers? We understand the possibilities. So that is a challenge that is happening. Um, also about understanding the different competencies in communication, like I mentioned earlier. Um, there are many companies that still see usually big companies that are not just IT, they just have an IT department, and they see the production of software like that, like a line of production, which I get it. It's not like we are like smoking a cigarette and thinking about how we can build something or just drinking coffee and coding at night. We need to be involved with the company and their needs and the KPIs and everything, but it's really hard to get the same output for every single person in the same way, you cannot predict this. Mm -hmm. So that is another challenge that I think us leaders need to be accommodated and we have to be the buffer. We need to bring engineering to the table, but also we need to make sure that the engineering team understand the needs and we find a, a solution together because it's no way that we are going to keep the cadence of work the same way across the year. Do you have any like specific processes or like the approach that is helping you to build the products here at, at the vault? Like if you compare it to previous organizations? That is specific here. Here, I really like the way that they think they allow us a lot of operational freedom. They say, look, we need this. This is not even, we need this. This is the problem space. Uh, we should provide, we should be able to provide this functionality to our customers. What do you think? Okay, give me, I don't know, give me two days and get back to you, or give me some time. Um, you come up with an idea, you build up the small team, and we work really close with product leads. So here the managers are called leads, because we, mm -hmm. I think the, the word manager is a bit tainted, and I, this is what I like, Walt. And you come up with a plan, you analyze the feasibility, and then you say, okay, what do we need? Okay, maybe we need like two people that work like this, Two people that were like that, a designer, a data analyst. Okay, here's the team. Let's see the plan. Let's check in a couple of weeks and let's move forward. And it's really organic. And it's not that I'm shifting people left to right because usually it's not for small projects. It's for really long lasting features, projects that may require years. Uh, because, but they have clear milestones on a high level. So the product area is really well organized. It's really well. I'm super happy to work on that. And they don't waste time. And so that for me was a welcoming pace because it was something that we built with my former head of product when I was head of engineering at Heikar. And we tried to get this process and we got it going and then and eventually the company uh, had a setback, a really big one. And then I came here and, well, I mean, I, I was looking for this, this company <laughs> and I see it, it's already going and they have a lot of experience and they have so many iterations on top of it. So that is welcome. And again, it's bringing everybody to the table and don't waste time. So is it like, because I read on your, on your website or blog that you have like a product lead, you have different roles in the team and you focus on building like specific, like a feature. So like a small teams responsible for the feature, mm -hmm. iterate fast. Iterate you fast. We have plenty of freedom on the tech stack. Mm -hmm. So we have a tech radar. We share a lot. Uh, but we don't have a top-down mandate that it should be built this way. We have engineering principles. Um, 
obviously these are like predicated. So on the engineering alone side, we, we have a lot, a lot of freedom. And then it's basically how the product leads sees. Like in my take, and this is the world takes as well, is product set the direction. And we are the engine that makes the team go move forward. Like the engineers make the code go that way. But uh, it's product who decides. It's look, we need to get this and we need X, Y, Z. And these are our, this is our definition of success. Guys, what can we do about this? Team, let's work on this together. Uh, that is really important because it gives the engineer purpose as well. They sit on the table like, and I keep, I, sorry, I keep repeating this, but for anybody who gets to listen to this, it's really important, especially the new leads that are jumping in the role. They need to understand that you need to work with the product leads and this is the way world does. This is the way that Forto did and so like, hey, Carol, many other really successful companies take Amazon. You mentioned you are uh, that the company is really open and not closing the way what technology to use or language mm -hmm. to use, right? Exactly. But um, my experience was, for instance, with the JavaScript developers. They are they are really hype driven. There are so many things going on on the market: new libraries, new new tech. Like I mean, like each week there's something new or each day. So, um, how do you cope with that, right? Well. It's, it's tricky because on one side, you really want to build something that lasts. So you want to put the best technology there. But I think it's all boils down to being practical and removing the ego. Um, I, something that I ask on interviews is like, how do you understand the difference between a, uh, like a, let's say a mid-level engineer and a senior engineer? And you can always say like a senior, senior engineer, like he's, this person is about, he or she or them is about uh, to, to jump to stuff. And they understand that technologies are just tools. Uh, if you remove the ego from that and you say like, this tool is doing this and I can understand the engineering principle on this, then they shall move forward with that. If you keep updating to the bleeding edge on absolutely everything, you also are on the bleeding edge of the updates from the third party tools that you might use or the open source community and some technologies come and drop fast. I remember a couple of years ago, we all needed to, it was either you were Team Kotlin or Team Go. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of, there was a lot of polarization and many companies said, no, we need to keep a hard line of working on this. Technologies are one way door, like libraries and small features are two way doors. Maybe you try it and you see it doesn't work and then you come back. But why are you adding that tool? What is the sense? And that's where the engineer lead and specialist staff engineers to say like, are we adding it because it looks cool or because it's saving us time? There are some prototype libraries on Android that, uh, that are experimental, that make some transition that are fantastic. But you still need to support things, uh, devices that are, I don't know, five years old for, for a person, for a consumer that is a client that wants to order food. Well, okay, maybe don't do the, like, the flashy thing. Make sure that it works first. So I don't know if this answers the question. Yeah, yeah, well said. Like, you need to be pragmatic. I think an ego in the bucket. Yes, right? exactly. So why, why, because the reason is, why do you want to add this fancy thing? No, because it looks cool. Yeah, because it's going to look cool in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. But are you really adding value to the customer? Are you making your life easier in six months? Well, you also give some freedom. I got the engineers tell me, Juan, I want to do this this way. Like, why? No, trust me, it's going to be good. And I think it's going to add value. And some things we might evaluate, uh, elaborate a bit too much, but it's also a balance uh, about giving the engineer the possibility to really explore something that you know is going to pay back, like uh, to, to have a, sorry, a return of investment, not payback. Let's talk different engineering cultures because now you yeah. work at the Vault, before you worked at Amazon, at OLX, yes. uh, and at many companies, but I think those three are really well known. And I mean like engineering culture in between those uh, those companies how do you see like what are maybe the main differences so basically when i moved to germany i i i, I got to get to amazon it was not the most positive experience because i really connected with the product customer oriented culture but the way the engineer teams were push was a typical american company that i mean you stay there and you grow a lot really fast but i didn't connect with that culture um, I prefer, for me, we are not, when I'm working with engineers, we are not in the business of delivering software, I'm in the business of building cohesive teams. 
And that for me is critical because if you have a way that you can build a team that works in the people's based on the people's strengths and you put their members out of the comfort zone in a normal way uh, and not because they are being overworked but they are being developed and, and like learning new things and trying new technologies and and seeing things you know, from a different perspective if you are able to do that you can grow a more lasting engineering culture that can deliver value consistently Many companies that are really aggressive with their products, they have more aggressive or demanding, demand, let's call, the, call them demanding engineering culture, and, but they rely heavily on new people coming in. I, so the average tenure that you have in Europe for IT, I think it's a year and a half, and then people leave on average. Here is three years and a half, or three years and three months, something mm -hmm. like that. So more than, like, let's say, it's, at least double, which is a lot. Uh, so my take from other companies, because for example, I also work for, when I was for uh, at Globant, I worked for Disney and ESPN. Great people, great products. I mean, I did parks, I did cruise lines, I did ESPN, uh, all the internal applications, the fantasy games and everything. But they were more focused on deliver a specific feature. Here on this, let's call it more European-centric companies, they're more focused about building a culture and a company. And I connect more with that. Because let's say tomorrow, world partners, I don't know, SpaceX, <laughs> any company, SpaceX, comes and buys us, buys the company, uh, because they want to make deliveries to them. Maybe we end up building guidance systems for the, for the rockets to Mars. Okay, they, they are going to bring us two specialists in aviation, but we will need to build software. I know for a fact that the engineers that I have on my team that I'm lucky to work with, they could be moved to a project like that and the guys will be successful because we try to teach them a mentality of how to work, to learn, to step out of the comfort zone, to apply the knowledge that they, that they got from college and also on the day-to-day -day working. So if you do have that and you can make like a radical change from the product that you're building or a small change, and it's always going to work. And this for me is more valuable for the company. Because if they need to change direction, or they need you to support another place and another place of the company, you can. You're not just like shipping, 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 and then like someone opens your code. It's... I want to ask another question yes, around please. it. So, because when I look at the Amazon, it's like super customer centric, right? If you are telling me about the vault, and I talk with a product leader from Tier Mobility here from Berlin, you are talking about like. Uh, it needs to bring the profit for the company. It needs to be profitable. We're doing this because like, we want to make money on that. It's not like we're doing it because we want to do it, right? So I'm trying to understand, like, for instance, what could Amazon learn from like Vault and the European organization? You have to sort on the whiteboard like super fast, the best way to transverse a binary tree that is in balance in, with a certain level of complexity. and. And many companies have this interview process and they put the engineers to work on something that is not meaningful or is not engaging. So something that I think that many companies, regardless the company, need to understand is you invest a lot of hiring, you invest a lot of compensation as well. Put the people on the critical path. Put the people to work and to bring their value. So this is something that we all need to learn. And I think many companies, like let's say more, American uh, mentality that are quite successful, please, could use to tap into them. But they are rushing so much to deliver value that sometimes some projects kind of are in this limo and it's more about shipping than anything else. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other side, look at the success that they have. So, like, for example, something that I took and I'm super proud of it is the way that Amazon handles uh, their own call and operations. It's fantastic. The, I mean, you can Google it. Spin the wheel process. Fantastic. But the story behind the spin the wheel process was several talented engineers, staff engineers, decided to try to build a system that will allow us to get proper insights and have everybody kind of like a, a control panopticum and ready to present. Because your team could come up any day and you need to have answers. And it was a completely academic way. There is no ego there. 
So it's like, why do you have this peak? Why are you doing, how are you measuring this? Why are you not measuring that? Everybody's in the table. So we can learn from that. I think it's a matter of balance, but mainly we all need to understand that we're working with people and we need to put them on the critical path. Does this answer the question? Yeah, that's, uh, it's really well. And I can, um, and I fully agree with that, like how the Americans are doing it. So they are doing like really fast delivery, really fast. And sometimes when you look from the outside, it's amazing. But from the inside, you look and you say like, hey, maybe it's a bit too fast, but still they are successful. So, I mean, but, but, but the thing is, everything comes at a cost. If we are like super mindful and kumbaya engineering <laughs> teams, we are not delivering value fast. Um, if we are super aggressive and we burn people, I'm not saying the case for this company, but let's say they burn people and they have a lot of burnout, uh, you are relying on having a constant influx of people. I mean, someone like, I cannot imagine like the work that, the, the amount of people that they recruited from Amazon need to process every day because everybody applied for every single position. Everybody wants to work there. So, it's a matter of balance. It's a matter of balance. We need to learn uh, how to be customer centric, but everything comes at the price. If you are to combine, we are lost. That's why I said like, let's put the smart people to solve the smart problems and just keep them a priority. Let them operate. And the longer they stay in your company, the more value they bring. Because they understand this and out. There's no, it's super expensive to have someone onboarding. It's super expensive. Like for me, an engineer to be fully operational in, in the core team, one of my teams is core, to be like fully dependent, seven, eight months, that, to be on the level that we expect this person to be performing. If I burn people, like the moment they're onboarding, they stay for what, for four, six months, and then they leave. But we talk a lot, and you mention a lot about the people who are really hands-on, really uh, proactive, like, and, and you said, like, if you got the projects, for instance, from the SpaceX, and now you built something completely different, yeah. uh, you will do it. But there are a lot of projects, like, inside the company, especially if the company is big, and you need to run them. And not every project is, uh, you know, super sexy, and not everybody is super excited about it, so... Um, but respectfully, I understand your point, but I, I, I know where you're going, and I know you don't mean this, but it feels like a generalization. For example, I think that there are many ways I don't want to pigeonhole people. So I'm going to apply this example to myself, but there are many engineers that love greenfield projects. On my case, I love to refactor. I don't know, it's about what part of my personality, but if I see a mess, I like to understand the mess and I like to find, I like to decipher the logic and I like to do this while it's operating. I, when I join OLX, they have this really big platform and system built in PHP. Yes, let's not laugh at PHP. It put bread on my table for many years. <laughs> I did that and I'm happy with it. And you can build some really great things if you do it properly. Luckily, you don't have to anymore. So anyway, <laughs> and, and my counterpart, my Polish friend that I mentioned, Michal Wazowski, he was doing the Greenfield project. I mean, the guy could can operate on a, a, anywhere, but they said like, you know what? Let me do the bridging. Let me build the facades. Let me do, start removing the old system and clean up, clean up, clean up while still being operational. And he did the Greenfield project. There are engineers who like to mature projects. There are engineers who like the Greenfield project and other ones who like to refactor, like my case. So I think it's about putting the right person. Right now, for example, my, the team I'm responsible for has 12 engineers plus a staff engineer and we continue growing. There are three teams. And when we, when I started, it was like this really big daily with 11 people. <laughs> Eventually, sorry, 10 people. Eventually it grew. But uh, it was like, oh dear God, this is really big. Mobile engineers, back and front and full stack. But when we make the divisions of the team, we try to put the people based on not only on their tenure, but in what they feel more comfortable to operate. Or one of our latest hires uh, based in Estonia, it's a fully operational guy. Like he, if it's up to him, he will sit next to the plug lead and say, okay, give me the list of five things shipping. And it's doing amazingly on the on-calls, handovers, and the triage and analysis. 
he's there. He's thinking about the scale infra. Or a staff engineer who is basically a code demigod. He's working on the core and the way that we can build our system and project the volume and everything, he's doing amazingly. So it's a matter of competences. But if I bring this super smart, intelligent man to the everyday meetings that I have, he will be depressed. <laughs> like he won't be unhappy, let's say. <laughs> uh, so it's a matter of finding the right people for, for in the right space. And many teams have to go to that transition, especially if you started with a small team that created a concept, when the concept to a prototype and the prototype is successful, you have a, like, like a change of guard, if you will. And usually, in my experience, I don't say in the case of Wall, but in other companies, you have one or two of the foundational engineers that remain attached, really committed to that project, and a lot of new people. And if you think, as talented as they are, the new people personality-wise align, where like the people that should have been there, the hustlers to create the project, no. They have different personality. I don't know if I will be, I'm doing really well at Wall. But I don't know if I'm the right kind of lead to start a project from nothing. I'm, my, based on my experience, I work on more corporate settings where I need to try to understand the metering of the tools, uh, the operational scale, working with the business stakeholders. I have a different upbringing, if you will. So that's the difference that I see. Sorry for the long answer. Oh, it's, uh, it's great. I think the last thing that you mentioned is uh, it's good to start another question. So. Because you said, like, I'm not a good leader, maybe to start the Greenfield project, right? So I would say this is really much your answer. And what I want to what, what I want to ask, what are your biggest like lessons learned? You know, that each year I feel like each year as a as a leader, especially in, in tech, you learn something new and you have this aha moment, right? So maybe you could mention some aha moments that were uh, really important for you and for your career. My biggest aha, I have two. One was about my skill set. When I moved to Europe, I thought like, yeah, I got hired by Amazon. I know everything. And I don't think I did a good job there. I mean, I talked with many other engineers there. And so like, no, dude, you were doing great. It was like, yeah, but maybe I didn't connect with the culture. Um, but that was like, OK, first, let's kill the ego. You think, <laughs> you think you know? You know nothing. And even if you do know, you cannot come here saying like you know everything. That was the big, aha. Uh -huh. The second one was when I was at OLX, because I think like I failed like a, as a lead and I went back to coding. And when I was hired, they told me, you know what? The team doesn't have an, uh, an engineering manager. The person who was engineering manager was getting promoted to head. It's like, the, team, the position is there. Right. Whenever you're ready, step in, which I eventually did. And in the process, like let's say going from the ranks as a senior backend, Again, as a manager, I was able to see there were problems, and there was a problem behind the problem, behind the problem, behind the problem. Mm -hmm. And I saw this on the business side, I saw this on the product side, I see this on the planning side, and I saw this on the personal side of every person and every engineer. That was my second aha. And the third was showing Walt is they asked me, and this is something that kind of like on a Peter Parker, Marvel, Spider-Man thingy with great power comes great responsibility. It's after a couple of years and pressure under your belt and performance reviews and success and nice contracts and nice roles and positions and traveling a lot, you realize that you know a lot. Like, you know, like I have other people coming out to ask me, like, how should I do this? And so I'm like, I don't know, let me think. I, and my interview process here was like that. I needed to present a case and really show my first six months here at the world with really specific variables in the middle that were quite complex. Um, and then I realized, okay, I know, I, I certainly know I'm senior enough now. Well, I'm senior <laughs> enough. And it kind of gives you like this feeling of speed. And uh, then you say like, I'm operating on a level that I cannot make so many mistakes. So it's kind of like you're going downhill. It's like speeding full with your bike. And then you realize how fast you're going. You know you're in control. You know every, everything is fine. But you do realize. And you need to keep up on that level. And you realize that you're responsible for a lot of people. I, I believe in leadership by servitude. That will be the whole closing comment on this answer. And if I can have a couple of bad days. But if I systematically fail on doing my job, I'm making the 
a life of, out of the 12th engineer, probably I'm ruining the day for at least half of them. If I don't have the right mindset on the one-on-ones, if I don't work properly with our product lead, if I'm not responsive enough on the things that I need to do, if I don't plan things properly, if I don't do, do my job well, I'm affecting a lot of people. I don't want that on my conscience. So, but being able that you need to operate on that and be on that level, it also like uh, op- it spills to other parts of your of your life. You start taking good care of yourself. You start like doing meditation. I do a lot of therapy for, since many years. I cannot recommend it enough. And then you realize, yes, I, I'm operating this really big engine. I need to be careful. So yeah, on my current process, like the show was like, don't worry, I won't crash the Ferrari. It's the San Argentina show, uh, referring to a World Cup here in Germany. Well, it's like they crashed the Ferrari because we lost the World Cup. Yeah, well, yeah. So I can you can crash the Ferrari, and you're driving really fast. That was it. Moment. <laughs> like, oh God, moment. Yeah. So yeah. Um, the last question that I have. Yeah. It's uh, can you recommend any books, podcasts, or maybe resources that were particularly helpful for yourself? Buy it on Amazon or wherever you get your books. The Daily Stoic. Mm-hmm. Because I can talk about many methodologies. So I'm going to say two things. On the ego part, the daily stoic, you, li- you make your coffee in the morning, you wake up before every- anybody on your family. And this is what I do. Well, I usually go to the gym, but when I do it, like I have my five minutes of quiet. I did my daily reflection. You can do the journal in the meditation, whatever. This is what worked for me. Coffee and a reflection, like staying humble on that. Um, and the second one is try to find your own style of working because I can suggest is, uh, I keep mentioning this thing that the three amigos, everybody on the same table, um, be an empathetic leader. That might work for you and that might not. And maybe based on your personality, you need to be like a super assertive leader that is a nice person, but is super direct. I had, I, I, I had one of my best leads, tech lead, Marco Saladino, really wise man on so many areas of life, especially in engineering. Um, he will sit with me and he said like, on the core reviews are like me growing up as professionally and he would do this gesture like I'm what do you think and usually when I sit with a person it's like I think we should consider the three variables and I'm already framing the discussion because I think that this is more convenient the way I communicate but this great man he will just be quiet and let me do the work so it depends on you so meditate be humble and yes and i'm pretty sure on your podcast there are a lot of really great books the manager path first break all the rules also i forgot the the authors that's i know about but they are pretty like if you google them you can find them uh, they are fantastic books first break all the rules if you really want to have one but uh on the manager path uh but yeah but try to find your style like think about what how are you happy operating or doing things and then go into that because we'll always be missing some technique or book or reading and read everything i mean reading is fun and we have a lot of downtime between meetings read so to to be honest like a lot of experience what i notice a lot of experienced guys and leaders with whom i talk and i'm making those podcasts they usually are saying like maybe i will surprise you and i saying about the stoics about the philosophy about the things that are outside of the tech bubble and like a classical things. And to be honest, they are the most successful. This is what I notice within like, you know, the, the community with whom I talk. So it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. I, I don't know like it was well for me. I humbly present it, but uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, I was lucky enough to go to a couple of talks in the building here from Salando. There was this LGBTQ leader. And uh, she was talking about many topics, but one of the topics was about consent in communication. Because we always talk about consent, like, okay, do, can I hold your hand or like break this barrier or like or many things. But there is also consent and communication. And um, I really like this idea. And then I said like, okay, I'm going to apply this. How am I communicating with, am I imposing my communication style? Am I, and then I took that and then I realized that really improved my one-on-ones. But it's a matter of saying, 
like, guys, we all code. Sometimes we don't know what's going on in production and we try things. So try, measure the result, try again, and whatever keeps you driving and moving forward, go for it. We have to read about everything. The best designers in the world, the best engineers in the world, not, uh, as we said, not a sign that I preach to, but the Steve Shops always said, like, I'd rather hire an engineer that scores eight, but also plays guitar and reads books, than an engineer that scores 10, and the only thing he does is coding. Mm -hmm. And I think he got that right. Again, it's not, I know, he's really great at selling computers and a great product person, but, um, but he got that right, among many other things. We have to be more uh, renaissance or more holistic mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. professionals. Knowledge is everywhere. Okay, so the last question, last question. Because yeah, yeah, please, I love it. Thank you. <laughs> because um, you mentioned how you learn. So you learn a lot from the mentor, from your leader, right? Yeah. You said about the books outside of, the, let's say, the classical scope of the manager or the mm -hmm. leader. And um, for me, my experience was like, I read those books, like I, I read ten of like tons of business books. But what I learned the most are, is the experience in my own mistakes, which is maybe... Yeah quite obvious, or I learned from other people talking with them, like mm -hmm. in general, in really loose atmosphere. But maybe I was not uh, lucky enough, but I never learned anything from the organized trainings, like <laughs> any, anything. Uh, well, because maybe some companies, not everyone, luckily I was lucky enough on that. Uh, they, they make the trains for compliance. They don't make the trains to make you grow. And uh, also I tried several platforms and there is this uh, kind of like easy pill to swallow trainings. Uh, I don't want to mention any because I think it will be unfair. At least the one that I saw is like, take this course about handling disagreement. And there was this person and they bring like, I know, like chief staff engineer from Microsoft. And so like, yes, this person like started with Bill Gates. Has, and they presented five bullet points, and that's it, finish course. Share on LinkedIn or other social network. Dude, it was like 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Worse than meat. So, and the last source of knowledge that I got uh, to operate and also to understand the system that I'm building, that we are building, I just talk with the engineers. I mean, I'm lucky enough to work now with two staff engineers. I, I sit with them, like technical handovers. I, I grab a metaphorical bubble of popcorn. And like, yes, take me to school. It's fantastic. And they are telling you all this information you're missing out on the day to day. And they're highly skilled engineers that are able to condense it properly. And they are not giving me a special class for me. They are talking to engineers, so I better keep up. So that keeps me on the edge of knowledge. And then I talk with the product lead, and it's the same. Then I talk with the CTO and try to understand the business need. And I mean, every time I show a, a company, it's, I literally ask, what is the, why are you hiring me? No, no, not me. What, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? And why me? Why me? No, no, because we need an engineer lead that is going to be the X, Y, Z. What any, any lead can do that. That is not interesting. No, we have this really big problem. We don't understand. We are in the process of facing out this, this uh, thing A, now to thing B, like we need someone to set a strategy on that. Okay, that's more interesting. So who are the people that are involved? Talk to that, that analyst, talk to other people, like get in deep. That's the knowledge that we need to do on the day to day. Then the methodology, it's up to us. Read and talk. And yeah, usually the corporate trainings are compliance. Awesome, Juan, like thank you very much for a super interesting talk. I really appreciate your insights. No, thank you for listening to me on my, <laughs> on my rants. <laughs> Better tech leadership powered by Brain Hub. Follow Les Schick on LinkedIn and subscribe to the Better Tech Leadership newsletter.